but thank you very much for coming and joining us today. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we'll do today. We've got four segments to our presentation. The first is a quick overview of the interaction of agriculture and greenhouse gases, and I'll be presenting that. Then Dave Huggins will discuss how agriculture management in general influences greenhouse gases. That will be followed by myself discussing more in particular how organic ag might be different and uh, some of the management implications. And then the last part will be a discussion of some of our knowledge gaps and, and potential next steps to learn more about organic agriculture and greenhouse gases that Lynn Carpenter Boggs will present. So I'm going to start out with just a very quick schematic here of the whole idea of the greenhouse effect and why uh, we do have so much attention being paid to it. The first uh, thing to know is that most of the incoming solar radiation is reflected back from the Earth. And if we did not have the greenhouse effect from the atmosphere, the temperature at the Earth's surface would be quite a bit colder than it is today and probably wouldn't be supporting life as we know it. So we do need some degree of greenhouse effect to trap some of the heat coming in from the sun. But as we increase the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more of that solar radiation is trapped, and, and that has been documented now. And then theoretically, all other things being equal, over time, the uh, temperature, average temperature, will be increasing. So that's kind of the basic schematic of what the greenhouse effect is all about. Why do we even worry about greenhouse gases? Well, just thinking about agriculture, the factors listed here all could have a dramatic impact on agricultural practices around the world. So clearly, if things change, as, as many of the predictions suggest, a lot of our agricultural systems will need to be looking for ways to adapt to a changing environment. And a great example that we've seen here in, in the Pacific Northwest, it's, it's a very graphic example, is how the changing uh, temperature regime, where the winters are no longer as cold as they used to be, has allowed uh, the mountain pine beetle, which has existed here for, for uh, millennia, it's, it's a native pest, but it was essentially kept at a, a, uh, a balanced level by those low temperatures that would kill off a large portion of the population. Without the extreme cold temperatures, its population has exploded, and now we have devastation of millions of acres of forest. So that, those are the kinds of changes, they don't have to be very big, that can trigger a, a big biological impact on our agriculture systems. There are a number of greenhouse gases involved. Uh, we've got several listed here. The main ones we typically think about are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. There's others like ozone and some of the, the fluorinated and chlorinated uh, molecules. And then there's water vapor. And we often don't hear much talk about water vapor, even though it actually has the predominant uh, role in affecting the greenhouse of, um, heat trapping properties, but that's because there's not much we can do in terms of our, our human activity. That's basically a function of more planetary uh, systems with ocean um, evaporation and, and, and whatnot. So we tend to focus on the carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, but these are not all created equal. They're at different levels in the atmosphere and they have different uh, ability to trap heat, which is typically expressed as the CO2 equivalents, that's the, the nomenclature and, and how you'll often see global warming expressed in a lot of the different research. So CO2 is set as a one, and everything else is relative to it. Methane is uh, set at 25, and then nitrous oxide about 298 times more powerful than CO2 in terms of trapping heat. So those are the three gases we tend to, to focus on in general and in agriculture as well. Here are some graphs showing historical change of those three uh, gases over time. And most of them started to show a pretty dramatic increase around 1800 when the Industrial Revolution began. A lot of the earlier data are based on ice core samples and other kinds of techniques. And so perhaps uh, there's a little more variation, but you can see the exponential rise in more recent times for all three of the gases. And we start to look at where these gases are coming from. Typically, we see that agriculture and land use 
contribute about 20% on a global basis. And that includes both the, the actual agricultural practice as well as any changes in land use that might lead to loss of stored carbon from the soil. Carbon dioxide is the one uh, gas that gets the most attention and it's the, the largest one in terms of mass. This particular slide gives a, a feeling for the relative um, places where the carbon is stored in the global system. You can see that the oceans are the, by far the largest storehouse and a lot of the CO2 that's been emitted over the past few centuries has ended up in the ocean uh, with some effects that are now being documented. But the atmosphere is a fairly small slice. So relative to the atmosphere, the terrestrial system and the soil in particular holds about twice as much carbon as is in the air. And therefore we can see that increasing carbon storage in the soil at least theoretically has the potential to make a significant impact on that CO2 that's in the air. On the flip side, the fossil fuel number is twice that of the terrestrial system. So if we keep burning fossil fuels, obviously just doing the numbers will swamp any ability for the terrestrial systems to offset uh, those emissions. Looking at agriculture, the story is slightly different. Uh, typically, at least in the US, nitrous oxide is by far the largest contributor uh, to the greenhouse gas situation. Uh, methane is the next, and CO2 emissions generally are, are relatively small compared to other sectors as a, of the society. Looking at total emissions in the U.S., you can see how CO2 does dominate, and that's due to transportation and uh, power generation, which are dwarf the emissions from uh, agriculture. So if we're going to see what we can do in agriculture, we'll probably start by trying to look at uh, what we can do to reduce the nitrous oxide, opportunities to sequester CO2 in the soil, and then potential to work with some of the methane emissions, particularly from manure sources. Here's a breakdown of how different segments of agriculture contribute to greenhouse gases. The largest is nitrous oxide, mostly from the soil system, how we manage our fertility in the soil. The second is enteric fermentation. These are the ruminant animals, and their belching, in a sense, uh, is the methane release that we can't really control very well. And then we've got energy use, manure management, and some other sources, all of which we do have some potential to influence with management. Nitrous oxide is one of the more difficult gases to get a handle on. It's uh, expensive to measure. It's very sensitive to, to conditions. And in this slide, we've illustrated uh, if you were to go out and put some chambers in the field, like uh, this research is doing here, you put a lid on it, let the gases escape from the soil for a period, and then you take a sample out and go ahead and analyze it. It's a very labor-intensive practice, and perhaps it's something you would want to be doing once a day over time to monitor a system. So in this field in Washington State, uh, the daily sample put us basically at zero. There's no nitrous oxide coming from that system. But when you go back and do it on an hourly basis, which obviously is much more expensive, we see this big spike at 10 hours after the system received a fertigation of nitrogen. And then that spike is almost gone within an hour or two. So very dynamic gas, very difficult to measure. But given that it's almost 300 times more potent than CO2, it's critical that we measure this and, and take it into account in our assessment of agricultural systems. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to mention that there certainly are uh, emissions from fossil energy use in agriculture, but if we start to look at that part of the system uh, in the context of the entire U.S. food system, agriculture only accounts for about 20% of those emissions. So in addition to what we can do in agriculture, there are other players in the food system that can also have an impact on their CO2 emissions from energy sources. And even just looking at the home situation, about 30% of that energy use is uh, occurring in the home with refrigeration and cooking and whatnot. That's a fairly substantial contribution that actually exceeds the uh, fossil energy use in the agricultural sector. So there's lots of different ways we can work with the food system's contribution, and agriculture is one of them. At this point, I'm going to pass on uh, the discussion to Dave Huggins to talk about how agriculture management in general can affect greenhouse gases.